Thank you for staying with us, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you both um, audience online and audience uh, in Victoria Theatre for your engagement. We got 17 questions for the panel just now, which we'll try to make sure you get answers to. So just a reminder for people who are just joining us for this panel, if you have any questions for the panelists, please continue to submit them at any time through the Pigeonhole Live uh, website. So you can see the URL flashed on the screen. It's um, www.pigeonhole.at and the passcode is artsimp2021. So if you have a smartphone, a tablet or a computer, please launch your internet browser and enter the URL and the passcode and select the panel for which you want to submit your questions. Um, there will be no intermission for this event, so we ask you to try to refrain from leaving your seat in the middle of the panel. Uh, there will be time after the event for you to uh, take your washroom break. Right, now, um, without further ado, I would like to welcome our next panelists, and they are Moderator, Mr. Russell Storer, who, who has joined us in person, and Ms. June Yap. And we have Mr. Daniel Birnbaum dialing in from Sweden, and Mr. Takashi Kudo joining us from Japan. They'll be addressing the issue of art and the digital realm, and considering the question of whether there is any turning back. Now that art and arts programming expansion has expanded into the digital sphere. Was this something that had simply been accelerated by the pandemic? Well, that's what our panelists will be exploring today. So over to you, Russell. Thank you. Thanks very much, Pauline. And uh, welcome everyone who's joining us this afternoon, both physically and online. It's a real pleasure to be hosting the discussion today with three very esteemed speakers. Uh, my name's Russell Storer. I'm the Director of Curatorial and Collections at National Gallery Singapore. And um, as Pauline mentioned, the discussion today is art in the digital realm. And of course, with the um, COVID pandemic, um, there's been a scramble to digitize um, and museums have had to you know, go online. Um, and that's posed a number of challenges, but of course, a number of wonderful opportunities as well. So I'd like to thank uh, Plural Art Magazine and uh, National Arts Council for hosting this discussion today, which is, of course, very relevant to all of us. So first of all, I'll introduce all the speakers, um, and then each will give a short presentation on their work with the digital. Um, there'll be a bit of time for discussion, and then we'll open up to questions. And of course, you can post those onto the Pigeonhole app. Um, so our first speaker today um, is Takashi Kudo, um, who's the communications director for the Tokyo-based collective Team Lab. Um, who'll be familiar to many of us here in Singapore. Um, he manages their entire branding program. And established in 2001, Team Lab comprises artists, programmers, engineers, CG animators, mathematicians, and architects. Using digital technologies, Team Lab create immersive multimedia environments that navigate the confluence of art, science, technology, and the natural world. They've shown their work and been collected by museums around the world, including here in Singapore at the Singapore Art Museum, uh, National Gallery Singapore, and the Art Science Museum. Our second presenter is uh, Daniel Birnbaum, who's a Swedish art critic, theoretician, curator, and since 2019, the artistic director of Acute Art in London, which brings together renowned international artists, new media and technology, to produce and exhibit cutting edge vis visual artworks in virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. Um, Daniel was formerly director of the Moderna Mosaic in Stockholm and uh, director of the Städelskule in Frankfurt, uh, one of Germany's leading art academies, as well as its gallery space, Porticus. He was artistic director of the 2009 Venice Biennale and a co curator of the international section of the 2003 Venice Biennale as well as uh, of the first and second Moscow Biennales in 2005 and 2007, as well as many other exhibitions. And lastly, joining me here in person <laughs> is uh, Dr. Jun Yap, 
uh, who's Director of Curatorial Collections and Programs at Singapore Art Museum, which has a key focus on artists working with new technologies. June's former roles include uh, Guggenheim UBS Map Curator for South and Southeast Asia, Deputy Director and Curator at the Institute of Contemporary Art Singapore, and Curator at the Singapore Art Museum. June has organised numerous exhibitions in Singapore and around the world, including the Singapore Pavilion at the 2011 Venice Biennale with Ho Tsun Yen. So I now invite um, each speaker to present for a few minutes on their, pro uh, on their work, uh, particularly in the digital realm, and um, then we'll open up for a conversation. So I'd like to ask Takashi to come in. Oh, uh, thank you so much to invite me and um, invite us for the to explain a little bit, right? Uh, oh, yeah. Logo. <laughs> uh, like we are started from 2001 and it, uh, we are making it some weird output and still we don't know if it's our output is art or not, but um, maybe after 20 years or 30 years or it's maybe forever. But uh, in the future, maybe if our output leads to the keyboard art, maybe it's going to be in the art. But anyway, I would call it it's the artworks, but uh, yeah. So what we have interest is uh, we are like 600, 700 members. And as he said, it's we are quite many different specialists and it's create something on you know, like CG animators and the hardware engineers and the architects and the mathematician and create some things and it's making an output. And it's some of it's in our artworks and it's, is, uh, you can see it on Singapore's. And it's they, yeah, some art by team labs, and it's not so many times. So it's uh, one samples. As one is, uh, this is actually we opened two thousand eighteen at uh, Tokyo's, and now it we opened its team of borders in Shanghai too. Now it's uh, we plan to do open this team of borders, you know, all over the world, but. This is very weird space, like 10,000 square meters and uh, no map. So the, all the people is lost their way for things and they have to explore. And if you're lucky, if you're open mind, maybe you're going to discover something. And uh, this is, there is, uh, actually it's, oh, sorry. Uh, like over 60, artworks inside and you, you can check on in our website but it's uh, quite many different uh, artworks was just communicate each other's and they will not stand stuck on one loose and they are moving around and as we team labs it's also if we cannot control them and it's, it's never happened at the same and uh, they're uncontrollable but what we want is we wanted to bring the people to be inside this weird space with physical bodies. And it's this is some kind of this our imaginations. Like like inside of our mind. It is chaos and uh it's completely normal. <laughs> that is a genuine borderless. And it's what we wanted to say on here is we believe it's a like borderless world, it means inside our mind. No limitation of the creativity and imagination is beautiful. That is what we wanted to say. And uh, if you are lucky, and it's after pandemics, and it's a uh, please visit the office in this space. And it's another one is um, actually you can actually Google it of the uh, just a flower bombing home. And this is, is actually it's very weird artworks we have. Done in last years when we were in like 
remote work at the pandemic at homes. And uh, you can check letters. And it's a letter that I'm going to explain it a little bit more. So, but uh, this is, you can draw this at homes and uh, just upload of this, uh, your artworks on Google, YouTube Live. And you can see it in real times. And you can see the original flowers from this Tokyo, from the Singapore, from this Stockholm, from this London. And uh, that is basically the general piece of the artworks. And it's, it's free. So, and it's fun. So if you want, it's a, please do it. That is uh, quite short introductions of Team Labs. And it's we love Singapore. And uh, please, Daniels. <laughs> Thanks very much, Takashi. Um, yeah, I'd like to invite Daniel. Hi, Daniel, to um, yeah, share a bit more about your work with Acute Art. So good afternoon and good morning. Um, I am, am so pleased to be with all of you. And hey, Takashi, it's so nice to be here. Um, so I join you from Stockholm, but normally I work in London. Um, and it's now two years that I've been involved uh, with the um, um, I've been involved with Acute Art as the artistic director. And um, Acute Art is um, it's a kind of studio or a laboratory um, helping artists to realize their visions in new, in, with new tools. And um, as Russell mentioned, I've been working with the uh, rather traditional biennales and museums. And, and um, in a way, this is relatively new territory for me, um, but I have always followed artists, and um, many artists today are um, are um, interested in these new possibilities. Um, I think that every century there are, you know, one or two new big um, changes when it comes to art media. Think back of you know how photography changed everything in the nineteenth century and people exaggerated and said that, you know, it would kill painting. And, you know, there were, there were lots of exaggerations and confusions, but it certainly did change not only the distribution of uh, uh, visual material and art, it actually changed what art can be. And in the 20th century, we had a few paradigm shifts. You know, there was, um, uh, there was radio and cinema, and then came um, um, television and video, and then came the internet. And, and, you know, each of those shifts actually meant a lot for the very um, understanding of what art can be and our, how art can reach an audience. And ultimately, the ontology of art being, you know, what an art piece is. And I think in this century, we have a, a cluster of new, new mediums that are kind of maybe not the same, but very related. Augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. And then... Um, Let's see if I can, if I can, um, change, if I can show the, the works. So a few um, years ago, uh, we uh, started to work with artists and one of the very first artists we worked with was, um, the American artist Jeff Koons, who is uh, primarily known as um, a sculptor and um, painter also. And, um, and, you know, we, we introduced him to the world of virtual reality. And um, actually here in Stockholm, we launched um, the piece. Um, it's a ballerina in, in a beautiful garden. And uh, one may wonder why someone like Jeff Koons, who's so well known uh, for other things, would be interested in these possibilities. Um, I mean, I do think that artists tend to be interested in, in, in novelties, so it's maybe not so surprising. And in Jeff's case, I think it's to do with his perfectionism. No object in the world is perfect enough for Jeff. So, of course, you know, in VR, in virtual rea reality, he could do this unbelievably shiny, perfect, uh, um, perfect, uh, um, young dancer, a ballerina. 
At the same time, we approached Marina Abramovich, with whom we also did a virtual reality piece. It was launched um, in um, yeah, a number of places at the same time. But one of the more interesting contexts what was actually the ceremony for the Nobel Prize. So she spoke to scientists. And uh, Marina, um, as you all know, is primarily someone known for her performances. Um, Marina is now in her 70s, and you know, she's thinking about her own future and the future of her art. Being a performer, she doesn't leave uh, perfect uh, sculptures and paintings behind. I mean, she does also, but everything is based on her as a person. So what we did for her was a kind of an avatar, uh, but the piece is also about bigger issues than just an individual artist. It's also to do with the climate uh, change. So in a way, the piece was an interactive VR piece where you could change, or rather you could save the artist, but when you save the artist, you would also save the planet. And as Russell said, the, or even in the introduction to this symposium, it was mentioned, that the current situation um, has, of course, fast forwarded certain developments. And I thought that we were exploring these uh, new possibilities for several reasons. I mean, artistic curiosity, more or less philosophical issues, what happens to art in this new technical environment, but also maybe, um, you know, in relationship to, to the climate crisis that we would you know, explore ways to communicate art uh, without traveling and shipping so much. And all of this, I thought, was something that would become more and more relevant and urgent, but maybe in a few years. But suddenly came COVID, and uh, all the things I was thinking would happen in a few years happened right away. And we were all isolated, and no one could travel, um, and uh, all museums were closed. And uh, there's an American artist who maybe you've heard of called Kors, who's a He's a graffiti artist originally, or street artist, but uh, he's become a very uh, important, very visible artist in, in, in the traditional art world. In a few weeks, he opens a big, big museum show in New York, but he's also very interested in these new possibilities. And this is no longer VR, this is AR, augmented reality. We may talk about the, uh, you know, the differences about this in a few minutes, but AR is something that is mainly visible on, well, on iPads or in, on telephones. And you can place things anywhere in the world. And we did a big show with Kors. And you can see here, uh, you know, one of his floating companions. That's what he calls his, um, his figure. The companion was placed in New York and London and Paris and in big Asian cities at the same time. And you see it here uh, outside the Louvre in Paris. And, it, you know, people could see it with their telephones. And I think we reached a few million people in a few weeks. And, and it, this is, you know, it just shows that these mediums are you know, have an unbelievable potential. The course project reached much bigger audiences than anything I've ever done, including the Venice Biennale. And we've done similar projects with a number of artists. Olafur Eliasson, who is someone I'm sure you have heard of, very interested in the, the ecological, um, post, you know, the ecological issues and in, you know, the necessity of developing new art forms. We did a piece called Wunderkammer. Wunderkammer is a German word, uh, you know, curiosity cabinet. And he brought all the wonders of nature inside. So when we were all locked into our apartments or, uh, you know, into our houses, he placed a sun and a raining cloud and a rock and a bird inside. And all of these things are visible on an app. A acute art has worked with many institutions. We've done projects for some of the better known museums in Europe and uh, in, with the Serpentine in London and many other places. But now we're also launching our own platform, which is just an application, just an app. But it's actually one of the biggest art apps in the world right now. So if you're curious, you should just download a cute art app. It's um, for free. And uh, you can interact with these things and you can place these AR objects in your own house. And there are a number of artists there, um, in, including Olafur, the pieces you see here. Um, Nina Chanel is an American artist, very interested in, you know, in, in, in these mediums as well. She is a 
politically very engaged artists, and, and she's been doing things that relate to Black Lives Matter. And um, she did a piece called Imaginary Friend. And she is planning to do a number of spiritual leaders. And this imaginary friend um, looks very much to everyone uh, like a black Jesus. And she plays this Jesus in, in several places. And I would say it's a kind of intervention. And it shows that AR can be a little bit almost like, let's say, street art or graffiti, that you can introduce things where no one expected them. So she plays this um, uh, black Jesus in the middle of Washington during a kind of um, Black Lives Matter march. This happened just a few months ago. Um, we did an exhibition. So, uh, you know, we, one can do AR also in relationship to institutions. There's an institution in China, in Beijing, that you may know, called UCCA. And we did, I think, the first um, ambitious AR exhibition for a museum. There have been other examples, but this was quite an ambitious group show. So there were pieces by Chao Fei from China, Kors from the US, um, Ula for Eliasson from Europe. Um, so an ambitious kind of electronic group show. And, you know, it was curated by me, but I never left my apartment in London. So it shows that this is a very strange world. Or, you know, it made me feel I was part of a kind of a science fiction novel, but it actually worked. And I think in China, it's been very popular. And all these things are invisible, you know, if you just enter the space. But if you look at it through the phones uh, or the iPads, it's very visible. And uh, Phil Tenari, the, the director of UCCA, told me it's been, you know, a very popular show in, in spite of the fact that it's, you know, so, um, yeah, so surprising in many ways. And last example, um, uh, when all the museums in London were closed, and they are still closed, we staged a big group show called Unreal City, 35 AR objects along the river in, uh, in London. Um, you know, it was a prototype for future possibilities, I would say. We did this together with a magazine called Dazed. Dazed is a, you know, very, um, very popular magazine for, for uh, um, fashion and music and, and, and art. And they have very large audiences. So we didn't need any kind of sponsors and we didn't need any institution. We just did it on our own. And we placed these uh, a little bit like you all know Pokemon Go. This is a much more exact Pokemon Go. In Pokemon, you always had to look for the object. But we could place these you know, in a very exact way. And some of the objects were enormous. So there were 10 artists from different parts of the world. And it was up for, yeah, until a few days ago. And uh, yeah, it's, it's an experiment, but I think we can do similar things basically in every city. So for me, this is interesting that, you know, I've spent most of my life in very classical art institutions, museums, and yeah, as I said, the Venice Biennale and such, such initiatives. These new mediums actually make us, um, I mean, liberate us to a certain extent from those structures if we don't uh, want to be in them. I have nothing against museums or uh, galleries, but it shows that the, the potential is huge and there's a kind of, maybe one could even call it democratizing possibility here, that you can reach audiences that have no relationship to the normal art world structures. Um, that's one of the reasons why I find this very interesting, the possibility to reach people everywhere. Yes, that was my presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Daniel. Um, and uh, June, you're last. Hi, every Hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon here. It's afternoon here. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me to this symposium. Um, so as uh, some of you may be aware, uh, the Singapore Art Museum's buildings are currently undergoing redevelopment. And uh, when we reopen, we are, uh, as Russell has mentioned, we are looking to have a greater focus on media and technologies in particular how they are embedded in the practices and ideas of contemporary artists, but also intrinsic in our contemporary life. My own interest in technology goes back uh, a little, and here uh, perhaps uh, Daniel's reference to science fiction, you know, uh, well, surfaces again, and in, re in, in relation to the, my own background as an art historian, um, my own interest goes back to the 1990s, um, developed to an interest in cyberpunk science fiction, 
uh, through authors such as William Gibson, known for his titles such as Neuromensa, Idoru, and of course, Neil Stephenson's Snow Crash and The Diamond Age, uh, Bruce Sterling's Islands in the Net, and uh, Greg Egan's Permutation City, as well as the early editions of Wired Magazine, which started in 1993. I'm not sure if um, anyone in the audience might also recall uh, the early days when uh, games like SimCity in 1989 uh, had an oriental uh, aesthetic mode where you could transform your entire city or overlay it with um, a theme of um, being in ancient China. Anyway, so um, what I'd like to share in the context of Sam's work is our current exhibitions, projects for which uh, media and technologies play an intrinsic role. Uh, but in a way different than, say, the new media exhibitions that I curated in the early 2000s at SAM. Uh, though even though in uh, the early 2000s, we were already presenting artworks in video, in code, uh, web art of the likes of uh, early Yang He Chang, Haven Industries, and also hybrid mixed reality works. So the exhibitions I'd like to quickly draw your attention to, uh, you see here on the screen, is a Cosmic Wonder Expedition by Choi Ka Fai. This is an exhibition that we're presenting at Tanjung Paga District Park. It's an exhibition about connections where the spiritual and virtual are juxtaposed. It's developed from research by Berlin-based Singapore artist Choi Ka Fai, who has an interest in the metaphysics of the human body in the last decade. It explores shamanistic dance cultures in Asia currently, including Singapore, Indonesia, Siberia, Taiwan, and Vietnam, where these altered states are interwoven with digitized um, representation, interpretation, and speculation by the artist. So here are a few images of the presentation of the work um, at Tanjung Paga. And here you see um, what one component of the exhibition, the Gertai of Virtual Gods or Song Stage, referring to rituals of communicating with other beings. And these um, kind of ethereal connections with which Kafa is exploring are then juxtaposed with uh, digital ones, which is actually quite interesting. If you um, consider, you know, it was William Gibson who had said in, uh, who had written in his um, fiction, Burning Chrome, uh, published in 1982, when he coined the term cyberspace, um, the term was meant to refer to the mass consensual hallucination of computer networks. So here you really see the two come together in uh, Kafai's uh, exhibition. The other exhibition that we are showing right now is uh, Escape Velocity 5 by Zai Tang. It's uh, at the Ni An Kong Si Concourse Gallery at National Gallery Singapore. This is an immersive presentation where one is plunged into a soundscape where sound becomes the texture of the aesthetic experience. The work is based on Zai Tang's research using field recordings of wildlife and natural habitats in Singapore that, given our limited space, are also constantly under threat by urbanization. The experience is at once mediated for an intensified experience that speaks to ecological crisis, but also a very familiar sounds, um, bird and insect calls, uh, which we, we do recognize still in our nature and environment, but we probably overlook. Uh, though maybe not for very long if urban development reduces, uh, keeps reducing their spaces. So this work, while technically mediated, prompts us to examine our relationship with nature as a city and as a species living alongside these other creatures. So I hope you have the chance to experience both exhibitions during this time, as well as their online programs. And here we have a little excerpt for you, um, which will just play for one minute.
that's it. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, June. And thanks, everyone, for your fascinating and illuminating uh, presentations. So we're already getting quite a lot of questions already. Um, so I just wanted to sort of pick up a bit on what Daniel was saying about, you know, the fact that there was already a sense that, you know, the digital was emerging, there was a turn, and of course Team Lab have been working in this field for a long time. But with this acceleration in the past 12 months, I mean, what are the major shifts you see, or do you feel there's been a, a greater openness to the kind of work you're doing? Are you in more demand? Or has it shifted the way you work um, in terms of working with institutions? Um, Takashi, maybe, do you want to start? Ah, okay. Uh, mm, like we personally, it's a, it doesn't change almost anything. And it's of course like it's uh, I feel very sorry and it's we know we understand of this situation of this, this pandemic world right now. And it's uh, from the uh, like create or it's uh, as uh, uh, like an artist. Or it's art collectives. It's our stance is it's not changed anything. And it's you know, from the beginning, it's you know, we have very much it's interest in I don't know what is work for the human beings. And it's uh, we using of the digital and technologies as tools and materials. And as we are not against of this anything. And it's uh, some people using of it that tools and the materials. And it's a different way to explain that is. And it's for us. Is uh, somehow it's a uh, I don't know, but uh, we at least in the I recognize the world very much by physically. It's not only eyes and the ears and the stuff, and it's uh, when I understand the world, or it's when I recognize the world, it's, it's much more like the physical. That's uh, one of the reasons that uh, we made uh, Team Lab Borderless in the space, and as we try to bring the people or visitor to be inside of its, our imagination world with physical bodies. That is uh, what we wanted to do. But it's, of course, in a couple of years, futures, like uh, when the Chiba cities is in, in real, or like a great Egan's world, it's going to be in real, or it's like both in the shell. We can it's connect it to its a digital world completely. Maybe it's a we can create it as like, like in a virtual world of this, you know, uh, something we want to explain. And, but so far, it's uh, still we are living in a physical world, fortunately or unfortunately. And it's, uh, in that case, it's uh, our work is like, of course, software and the coding. So, like, how to show our work is you now we need uh, like a paint. The paint is for us, it's a light. And the canvas is everywhere. So it's sometimes we are creating on in, uh, some museums, or it's, uh, sometimes it's in some very weird space, like in the arcade centers in Japan, or like even in the nature. That is uh, what we do. And it's one thing is, um, I can say is, like, I very much it's, I feel sorry about it's like in this pandemic situation all over the world. But uh, one thing I can say is, uh, it's gonna happen. It's you know, like now the most of the things is it's gonna happen. It's I mean it's you know, like you know, ARs, VRs, or it's a digital ticket or whatever. It's these things is uh, anyway. It's gonna happen in like five six years. But now the situations, unfortunately, it's and we cannot go out and it's we cannot use like a uh, ticket. Paper ticket, or it's you know meet up, it's a uh, face to face, and we try to avoid all that. So, like, it's gonna happen in ten years, but it just happened on now. It's became earlier than we expected, and it's a uh, I don't know, it's a uh, quite many negative face, and it's a uh, like disaster like this. It's uh, you know like even me. Sometimes I feel it's a almost gay back for the everything, but uh, I'm not professors and I'm not like a super smart person. So what I can do is we team up, try to make the world a little bit more 
positive and happy, and it's uh, it's not give up for the futures. That is something it's you know uh, our I we think it's kind of our rules, and um, it sounds like it's very stupid to say that, but it's you know I want what we want, keep on creating that this, this kind of stuff uh, in the futures, and it's I just respect any kind of people to create something. So that is my answer. <laughs> Thank you. Daniel, has it shifted the way you think about or approach the work you're doing or it's just, you know, amplified? Yes. I mean, I would say I agree with Takashi that the development was kind of uh, obvious and there already, but it has in many ways um, fast forwarded developments that we thought that we, you know, that we trusted. Um, it's interesting how people actually think and talk about the pandemic as a kind of, a, let's say, a dress rehearsal for a bigger shift that, you know, um, uh, philosophers like uh, Bruno Latour or Noam Chomsky have said that this is a dress rehearsal for, you know, us getting ready for the big crisis, which is the climate, you know, the climate crisis. Um, and this was picked up by top politicians, at least in Europe, both Macron and um, in France and Merkel in Germany ha has talked about it in exactly in those terms. So in a way, you know, it, it, um, it, the things working with these kinds of mediums, um, it's become much more visible. And, I, and, and, you know, in a more superficial world, I, I can tell you that there's not a one major fashion brand that has not contacted us thinking that maybe we can help them to do something since they cannot do anything. They cannot do the normal shows and catwalks and nothing physical is possible. And, you know, the entire art world, including the big galleries and the art fairs, they're trying to do things and they do it. You know, that one can sell art uh, on, uh, on the Internet, as we know, with online viewing rooms. But uh, when they say that you, they've taken the programs virtual, it's normally very, very meager. And, and you know, we, you've all noticed this, that it's often just a homepage with some JPEGs. And people say that it's, you know, it, they've gone virtual, which, of course, is not the case. So everyone is, um, you know, interested in these kinds of possibilities. I think it's early days. And, and you know, Takashi knows a lot about this. And, 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 and there are other initiatives in the world. And, and we are exploring these things with artists who are also known for other things. I mean, we do work with artists like Chao Fei, who's obsessed with the, the poetry of new visual, uh, you know, digital possibilities, but we also work, uh, as, as, as you saw in my little presentation, with artists who are used to the classical um, institutions and, and the gallery system and all of that. Um, I guess all of this is um, changing and people kind of know it. And, and, uh, and uh, this is not the solution to everything, to do an AR biennial instead of a biennial, and, um, and, but it's a possibility. And for us, of course, doing very heavy VR uh, works with the world famous artists shown in uh, in places like the Serpentine or uh, or in um, museums or art fairs. That is not possible either at the moment. Um, you know, we we did a very uh, light um, um, or let's say technically not very kind of a complex piece with Ai Weiwei, the Chinese artist. That was a collaboration, or it was launched with the Guardian, the newspaper in London. And that's just a 360 film about uh, uh, the life on planet Earth, animals, you know, homeless animals and homeless people. And, you know, it, 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 it reached, uh, you know, in the first hour, it reached, uh, I, I think, like 25 or 30,000 people. I've never done an opening at a gallery or a museum that has that kind of audience. This was just a kind of, you know, a, a foretaste of things. But I mean, for us, it changed, of course, that we started to do less VR and more AR. We will see how this uh, you know, develops in the future. But almost every artist I've ever worked with is a little bit curious about the possibilities of doing augmented reality, because it's not just in a closed world of, you know, you don't have to install it in a museum and uh, you don't have to have, you know, a very heavy techie setup. It's things that are embedded in the world and embedded in your normal life and in the everyday practice of your, you know, you, you can place things, an AR object next to your sister and brother and cat and, and in your house or next to physical objects and create quite amusing juxtapositions. And it's a very playful medium, I think. And, and um, 
I, I can feel that the artists are very interested in this, many. And uh, for us, it's been, you know, a breakthrough, basically, because it, it's not just working with well-known artists doing, you know, interesting, I hope, uh, works, but actually reaching other audiences outside of the institutions that are closed anyhow. So, yes, it has made certain aspects of all of this more visible and, uh, and, and, and us, I would say, more in demand, actually. I can imagine. Um, so I guess one of the things that you sort of note is, is that a lot of institutions really don't have the capacity or the skills or the technologies even to develop in this area. Um, so it is a major transformation for more traditional institutions. So June, maybe do you want to pick up on that? Uh, maybe how Sam is, a, I guess, yeah. an institution that's sure. about to reopen. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, I mean, I think it's already has been mentioned by Daniel. You know, the the situation has really pushed, put a lot of pressure uh, for everyone to ramp up when it comes to digital technologies. And so, like everyone else, we've kind of done that. You know, in terms of our offerings, putting them online, giving you know them a different kind of hybrid forms, and perhaps this kind of fragmented, uh, fragmented presentation. You know kind of like what we're doing right now, somewhat physical and also uh, virtual, is something that we will go forward with. Um, but I guess the other thing that's interesting for us in trying to uh, look more into digital and media technologies in the future uh, as part of Sam's uh, direction is uh, not just looking at visual, uh, digital visualities, but also looking at what artists are doing beyond that. And that includes things like, uh, you know, behind the scenes, a bit more technical, uh, more about the infrastructures, uh, perhaps of technology also, uh, more speculative kinds of ideas, you know, even down to things like uh, blockchain, you know, Bitcoin currencies, these sorts of issues. And there are artists out there who are doing it. I mean, an example is um, Terra Zero, um, looking at, uh, that was developed in Berlin, and it was really, you know, looking at how decentralized autonomous uh, organizations um, might become, well, art projects, right? And I think this, these are the sorts of things which are very exciting for us uh, to pursue to, uh, and to support even as an institution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just trying to combine some of the questions that are coming through. I think one is really how digital art um, obviously is very much about technology, but of course the aesthetic and conceptual aspect is crucially important. So I'm sort of interested to hear from, um, from all of you how you approach that or how you think about that. Um, and how that might transform the way art making is, you know, going forward with this landscape, or um, you know, changing so dramatically. Um, so maybe Daniel, with the commissions that you do, and as you say, you're working with artists who don't necessarily normally use digital technology. How do you talk about it, or how do you develop those ideas with them and get them to really embrace this um, new form of working? Yeah, no, so in a way we do both. I mean, we work with a, a lot of younger artists and, and artists who are very, very informed and very, you know, skillful when it comes to tech, uh, technical possibilities. But if you do something with uh, Marina Abramovic, who is a performance artist, or, or Anish Kapoor, sculptor, uh, of course, it's more like a dialogue. Uh, and and, and um, I see this as a kind of, I mean, in a way it's maybe comparable to producing a film. That you know, it, it's, it involves many people and it involves skills that the director or the producer don't necessarily have. You know, you, you need a cameraman, you need editors, you need all of this. And um, in a way, um, you know, our vision is to, and I hope we're doing this, that we're realizing things um, that are of interest, but also with rather significant artists, and that you know we can realize things with them that they could not have done without. The, you know, access to this medium. So, you know, if they could have painted it or if they could have made a film or a, a, an installation, we shouldn't even do the work. Uh, so in, in that sense, I hope that we're, you know, that at least is our idea that we do medium specific things that, you know, you need AR or VR to do these things. And, and there are uh, visual possibilities in VR that, you know, you cannot realize in, in normal cinema. That total immersion is quite an overwhelming thing. And AR opens unbelievable possibilities for, you know, mixing, um, uh, mixing the real world with the digital world. So, um, yeah, so, so it, in a way, that's the vision. For me, it's a little bit, it, it relates to something which is a more historical example, but it's one of the, one of the reasons why maybe I got into this, that 
And there was a, an American movement called EAT, Experiments in Art and Technology. And it, you know, it involved uh, in the 1960s, John Cage and Robert Rauschenberg and some of the best known artists. And um, there was an, an, an engineer there called Billy Cleaver, who actually happens to be Swedish. So uh, in the museum that I worked for a decade, we had many of the most important works from EAT. And, um, you know, I, I realized that it started to become a little bit um, nostalgic to talk about John Cage, even if I love him, uh, um, that, you know, everything happened in 1966. But this is half a century later, and there's so many interesting possibilities when it comes to this dialogue. And EAT actually had the same idea that, you know, what happens if key artists of the of a moment get access to visual possibilities that they wouldn't have had? And in a way, that is, I guess, you know, a grand version of what we're doing. But I hope we're doing something similar. Uh, of course, in the future, there will be lots of artists and a little bit more comparable to what uh, Team Lab works with and, and many and a few others that have a background maybe in gaming or in coding and, you know, digitally very skillful people. We're already working with some of them and, you know, doing things that are maybe they couldn't have done themselves just because they can code a little bit. Because, of course, people that we work with are experts in just that. But, you know, I, I guess the, 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 the skills of an artist will probably change a little bit in the future. I mean, not everyone. I don't think that this will eclipse the normal art world or remove the interest. You know, photography didn't kill painting and neither did video or television. So, you know, painting and sculpture will survive. But this is a new possibility, a new layer. And, and uh, you know, it, it introduces pretty fantastic new possibilities also of sharing things and distributing and, and you know, um, yeah, uh, reaching audiences without anything being shipped and without anyone traveling, basically. Thank you. Um, well, I'm getting waved at to wrap things up. <laughs> Sorry, it's very brief. But I think that ends on a very good note. I think it really encompasses a number of the key concerns and touches on a number of the questions that we've had about, you know, where things are going. So um, I think we can share the questions with the speakers and maybe get some responses. Um, so I'd just like to thank all our speakers. Um, it's the fastest <laughs> panel I think I've ever been on. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Takashi. Uh, Daniel and and June for it's joining like us. This, it's a yeah. Zoom, literally a Zoom. Uh, it's a Zoom uh, Zoom symposium uh, yeah. yeah, panel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Thank right. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you to Russell and June in Singapore, and to Daniel and Takashi for joining us for this exciting discussion, ladies and gentlemen. This takes us to the end of today's program. We, had, we hope you had a great time, regardless of whether you're here with us at Victoria Theatre or if you're tuning in remotely. For audience members at Victoria Theatre, kindly wait to be ushered out of your seats. Um, we will be flashing a slide now where you will see a URL and QR code for a survey uh, on your Singapore Art Week experience. Please go ahead and take that survey if you wish. Your participation in the survey also entitles you to participation in a lucky draw with some very attractive prizes. We hope to see you all again tomorrow. Many thanks and goodbye.